Hey, welcome to the channel today. You know I get a lot of questions, and today I'm gonna to answer your most common questions about the single plane swing. So there's no better feeling knowing that when you wake up in the morning to go play golf, so that you're gonna play well. There's no better feeling of hitting good golf shots down the fairway. So my mission today is to help as many people as possible wake up every day feeling good, that they're gonna go out there and play great because of the single plane swing. All right, so one of the questions that I get asked, probably more than any other question, especially recently since I've been on the golf course and I talk a lot about the single plane swing and you know, I love hitting drivers because driver is not, not only maybe what I consider the most important club in your bag, but it's also such an important club on the golf course to score well. But many of you have been asking about what's the difference between an iron, you know, how do you hit an iron with a single plane swing and let's say a driver or a wood. So. One of the ways I want to demonstrate that, and, and by the way, if you were to take a driver swing on video and overlay on top of it an iron swing, the motion is exactly the same. In other words, the sequence of events, the way the body works, the way the hands work, it's exactly the same. However, as you know, when you hit a driver, the ball's on a tee, and when you hit an iron, the ball's on the ground. So there's some different dynamics that must happen mostly in the address position that allow you to strike an iron off the ground and take a divot and you know compress the golf ball versus launching a wood off of a tee. So probably the best way to explain this is let's just talk about just swing plane in general. The first thing is that when I set up to an iron obviously the club is shorter right and it's, and it's on a more upright angle. This is a seven iron here. So you're gonna see when I set up that I'm still very much in a single plane. My body is still tilted and the club is lining up with my trail arm and my lead arm is visible, that is no different than if I grab a driver and set up with the driver. You're gonna see the same thing, that the club lines up with the trail arm, obviously it's a longer club, and the lead arm is visible. But I think where you're gonna see the most is, is when you come out to the front. And so let's grab the driver and then the iron again. And what you see here, and I always, I always have an alignment aid down when I practice, um, but when I hit a driver, you're gonna see that the ball position's inside my lead foot, I have my widest stance, and then I have the tilt. So now here's the driver, and, and the reason I want that is because I wanna be well behind the golf ball so the club can launch. When it comes in, it can start moving up and launch the golf ball off the tee. So I'm basically with the wood, putting my body width, stance width, and ball position in a place where I can hit the driver and launch it. Now an iron, you're not doing that, right? So grab the seven iron, and you're gonna see that I want to make sure that I hit down on the golf ball. Now I don't consciously hit down on the golf ball. I put my body in a position, so watch this. So I put my body in a position, I narrow my feet more, and look what happens when I do that. Watch my head. See, it goes more forward. And now when the hands come into the golf ball, see how the hands are in front of the club head as opposed to lined up with the club head with a driver. And with, with that naturally, because of my narrow stance and the ball position being further back, I'll hit the seven iron here and you'll watch. It'll compress the golf ball just because of the position of my body. But the motion is exactly the same. So when I hit a driver, or hit an iron, the motion's the exact same motion. So I'm not changing my swing. Obviously, the club plane is changing and because of the length of the club, and I have different characteristics of my setup, but nothing else is changing. So the answer to the question is really get good at ball position and setup, and you can find more about my alignment ball position trainer and some of my training aids to kind of help you with that. But you gotta get the ball position correct with the woods and obviously with the irons. Now, the next question that I get asked a lot is talking about the tilt of the body. Now, I'll do this with, let's just do this with a driver this time, and I'll kind of go through both the driver and the iron. One of the things that, it's kind of interesting because some of you say, well, I tried the single plane swing and it didn't really work for me. And I always question if you're, tr you know, what are you trying? Because if you do it right, it's going to work for you. I know it will because it's the absolute simplest way to strike the golf ball. But one of the things that I think happens a lot of times 
is people tilt their body too much because what you're seeing here at a dress is you're seeing a tilt of the body. Now, how much is it tilting? Well, I've measured this about 15 to 16 degrees, but I'm really not tilting that much. And a couple ways that I measure this when, uh, and I say measure, the couple ways I look at this when I'm tilted is that when I set up, and this is really important when it comes to getting the proper address, is when this club is on the ground, my head is over the club head, my nose is, but my, the club is pointing to the lead side of my body. See, if I wasn't tilted, it doesn't point to the lead side of my body. So that's a bit of a reference there I have for how much tilt I want. If I was over tilted, now it's way outside my body. So I just want to have enough tilt to the body so that I can be at that same tilt and impact. So that's what you see with a wood. Now let's grab the iron do the same thing. And by the way, ball position and stance width, stance width is a very important part of ball striking because they're very related. So you got to get the the stance width and ball position correct. So watch this here. Now, when I hit the seven iron, you're going to see that my stance is more narrow. The ball position is right here, five inches inside my lead foot. And what you get now is see the club is still pointing the same part of my body, so I'm not over tilting. And that allows me now to basically, when I get to the ball, compress it. And that's so getting the address and the proper tilt is very important, so don't over tilt too much. Now the next question that I often get asked is how do you take a divot, which kind of relates to this. Notice how I'm taking these little shallow divots here with this seven iron. You don't want to try, and I, and I get this so often, people are trying to take a divot. Um, I don't try to ever take a divot. I never hit purposely down on the golf ball. It's a naturally occurring event the club is moving down. Why is the club moving down? Because the hands are leading. See, when the hands lead, the club has a downward angle of approach. So when the hands lead, the club moves down. Now you might say, well, Todd, the driver didn't do that. Well, that's because the ball is forward, and when the hands lead, the club's coming slightly up because of my body position. But because the ball position is back, and my stance is relatively narrow, the handle of the club, the hands, will lead into impact. And when they do that, I'll do a little simple chip here, they compress and they'll take a slight divot. So once again, I think one of the things you have to really get good at and master is ball position alignment and stance width. And these are fundamental stuff that if you get that right, this stuff gets a lot easier. But then again, when I watch people practice, this is the stuff they seem to always get wrong. So really get good at alignment ball position and stance width and you'll start taking a, a naturally occurring divot because your hands will lead. Now, let me talk about how to get the hands to lead, which would be the next conversation because some people, some of you had mentioned the fact and one of the questions you ask is how do you stop the release early? Now this is an interesting conversation because I have this conversation a lot with uh, other instructors because they, everybody has this, uh, this common thing that they see when we're teaching is people tend to release early. Now here's what I've discovered about releasing early. Let's just, let's just define what it is first. Releasing early is when the hands, when you're coming down, the hands slow down too soon and the club head gets in front of the hands. And it can cause a fat shot, you hit behind it. It can also cause a thin shot where you hit on top of it. So there's a lot of things that occur when you release the club too early. Um, here's what's interesting, and this has been some of my research about how to stop the release early, and I'll give you a, a solution for that today, is it's really not about holding angles or releasing early. It's not really about can you hold these angles longer. And by the way, if you're doing that, that's a really, really big mistake. It's not about holding angles. And anybody I see try to do that, just overcomplicates the matter dramatically. What it is though, it's, think, let's, let's, let's just think through this with me for a minute. If I take the club back, my hands, where they are, hands, shoulder, torso have a relationship, right? And when I move the body and I come down into impact, the hands are leading, I come into impact, my hands, body, and shoulder have the same relationship here. So. There, we call this keeping the club in front and then returning the club in front of your body. So wouldn't you think 
that if anybody releases early, this relationship is changing. Well, it does, and here's what happens. And this is kind of what my research says, is that it's because your torso is stopping too soon. So if this upper body stops too soon, then the only thing left to go are the hands, and that's why you release early. So the solution to releasing the club early or getting the hands to lead, which is what you want, the solution is to make sure that the torso is opening up all the way through here. Now, I don't want you to run to the range right now and start spinning your body out. That's not really the solution. Here is the solution, though. Most people who tend to release early are over moving the backswing. In other words, they take it back too far and then they under move in the downswing. In other words, they go too far and then they stop too soon and the hands release early. So here's really what I want you to try to do. I want you to go to the range today if you got a chance and I want you to make the absolute shortest backswing you can. But I may videotape this so you can watch it. It's not going to be that short. I want you to go make the shortest backswing you can. Let's say it's right here and then swing through. And what you'll find is that in order to get the hands moving, the torso has to get more open and the hands move. See, I'm, 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 not, I'm not necessarily trying to shorten your swing, which is going to happen here. I'm trying to time up the hands with the torso so they can lead. That's, what, that's the way I would solve the problem of releasing early and hitting it fat and hitting it thin, is to get the hands and torso in the proper relationship and get the torso opening opening up through impact. By the way, the torso has 30 to 35 degrees of rotation at impact. So the torso is going to be opening here. And we've, the only way I can get the hands to lead is the torso opening up through impact. So that would be the solution for the release early. Now, that goes along with the next question of, I keep hitting it fat. And let's talk about you know hitting behind the golf ball. Let's talk about that one because it relates to the releasing early. But why do, why do sometimes you have so much trouble releasing the club early is because what happens with lower body. Think of it this way. There's a sequence of events, lower body, upper body, arms, hands, club. So there's a sequence of events occurring. And it, we're, trying to, we're trying to get the club to hit the golf ball. But if the lower body is incorrectly moving, then the upper body has to make some kind of compensation for it. So here's a solution that'll help you get, get this body, upper body moving correctly, is how the lower body works. And by the way, review some of my videos on the channel because I talk about lower body quite a bit. Most of this stuff, and you might be new to the channel, so you haven't maybe reviewed much, many of my videos, but I cover a lot of this stuff. Go back through my videos on the channel and take a look. Um, so let's talk lower body. Now, here's what I recommend with lower body. We have to get the lower body stable in the backswing and then stable and rotated in the downswing. So those two things, stable and rotated. Why do I want that? Because if this rotates and is stable, this upper body can then rotate and the hands can lead and you'll stop hitting behind it. So watch me hit this shot here and you're gonna see that I'm gonna move into a flex lead knee and I'm gonna keep it flexed as I rotate through because what it's doing is it's allowing me to rotate but it's, it's a limitation which I call stability. So let me hit this and you'll see me get through it here, rotated and stable. And see what you see there is this. You see me move into the knee, rotate, and the hands can then deliver the golf club because the body is getting to an open position. Now, I wanna just kinda of review this for you, um, that we're creating a bottom of the golf swing. What is the bottom of the golf swing? It's being produced from the, the only straight line you have is between, uh, at impact is between this shoulder, the arm, and the club. This is creating an alignment, right? Well, if I have a seven iron and I have the ball too far forward, you'll notice there's no way to get to that ball and create an alignment because the club's coming out of the ground. So if I put the ball in the correct place, now it can create an alignment at an angle which is why I now compress the golf ball. So a lot of what I'm teaching you is what's happening with this lead arm and how I get my body in position to return it to square. Now, one more question I get asked a lot, and this is a, this is a big one. I'm gonna take my glove off for this one. This is about lead hand position. Now, I probably, when I teach a golf school, generally there's between 10 and 15, maybe even 20 students in a golf school program. And people tend to hook the golf ball. In other words, 
they start, which is not a bad thing. I mean, you, you, if you're a slicer of the golf ball and you start hitting it to the left, sometimes you're pretty happy. But people always mention, well, when I start the single plane swing, I start hooking it. All right. Well, the only way you can really, really hook the golf ball dramatically is with club face. Now, having said that, the only way you can have the club face closed is the relationship of the lead hand and arm to the club face. So generally speaking, the lead hand gets too strong. And sometimes I see this. So remember what I said earlier in this segment was people tilt too much. And when you tilt too much, this hand tends to get here and then people grab the club. Notice how now this hand's very strong and the club face is very closed. So when it realigns, you see it close the club face. When this tries to line up with the shaft, it closes the face. See how too much tilt equals strong hand equals closed face. So what you get a lot of times is this kind of sequence of, well, if one thing is wrong, then all of a sudden everything starts becoming wrong. So having said that, let's talk about the lead hand position. The lead hand position, I, I don't teach grip and address. I teach address then grip. And so and there's a big difference because and for all the conventional instructors out there, and for those of you who have taken conventional lessons, this is probably where I get into a little bit of a conversation because the grip, when you take your hands and you put them on the golf club, you are building a relationship to the club face. But not only that, you are building a relationship to how the body must orient, rotate, tilt, and bend, must orient itself to how you hold the club. Keep this in mind because people always say to me, well, I'm gripping the club fine. Well, it doesn't matter. You know, the grip is part of the equation. The entire equation is how are you orienting your body and then gripping the club? Because watch what I do here. I'm going to give my body a slight side bend, but then I'm going to give my lead arm a rotation. Now, that means that with this bend, I have this orientation of the arm, which now I have the club face, which means that impact, I'm going to be square. Because what I see a lot of people do is they do this. They tilt and then they grab the club. They don't orient the hand to the target. So how do I stop you from hooking it? I've got to get this club face oriented with the hand correctly, but I got to get the tilt of the body. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to tilt your body, of course. I want you to grab your elbow, turn your hand. See, the reason I'm holding here is I'm isolating. God, I want you to do this. I'm isolating the upper arm and shoulder and rotating the hand gripping the club and now what you have is a tilted body and an orientation of the club face to the target and now guess what now because of the tilt look at this hand it comes from underneath and now you have a perfect single plane address position which when you get to impact look how square that club face is going to be and here we go again perfectly straight shot so notice how body position orientation all those things have to match up which leads me to the next thing that I hear from you on the channel quite a bit is you say well I tried parts of the single plane swing in other words I have a hybrid I heard a guy the other day say I have a hybrid swing I'm not saying you can't take elements from the single plane swing and get some benefit from it however to have a purely oriented single plane golf swing to have it perfect, you must have all of the pieces together to get the most out of it. Because here's the thing, don't you want consistency? And the answer is probably yes. Don't you want efficiency, the same distance every time? Yes, all those things are very important to golf. So I want you to get the absolute most benefit from the single plane swing. So I want you to get all the elements correct. For example, if you have the side bend, like I talked about before, but not the hand position, then you're not going to get the club face oriented correctly. If you have, um, if you're not quite in a single plane, if your hands are low and the right hand's on top, now you have a rotation you're still dealing with. So I'm not saying that you didn't run to the range and get some benefit from it, but my, my point is, is that to really, really be good at this, you need all these elements correct. And to run to the range, I had a guy the other day, he says, well, I tried it and it didn't work. Well, here's the thing. First of all, did you actually try it? And the answer is no, you didn't get it right because if you would have gotten it right, it would have worked. Second thing is, can you just try it one time on the range and get it right? That's like me saying, and, I, and I, this is why I responded to the, to the uh, question was, it'd be like me saying, I'm going to go get in shape and I eat a salad and wonder why I'm not in better shape from eating a salad. I mean, you, you have to be consistent and get it right, and that takes some time. 
just like when you make any changes. So if you're going to make the change to a single point swing, please get it right and then tell me how it's working because I know, absolutely know 100% that it's going to work for you if you get it right. All right. So the final thing, and, and one of the questions I get asked, and then I want to take you on the course, by the way. There's some things it's like side hill lies. We can cover those on the golf course. I'll take you out there. We'll do that. Um, but before I talk, the last thing I want to talk about is just lower body positioning. And, and by the way, this is on my channel as well. One of the things I think is critically important to get the swing right with a single point swing is, and I'm going to have uh, you come back here and take a look, is now that you're in single plane, and I'll show you what I mean by this. Let's just review single plane because there's, there's some elements here. And this kind of goes with my conversation of making sure you're getting everything right. When you're in single plane, which means you've got out of two plane and you're into a single plane position, your body tilt is correct, and you're in this nice single plane position. So you actually created more space from the golf ball. In other words, you were close to the ball and now you're slightly further away. Okay, so you got more space. Now, if, you're a con if your swing was conventional, previously it probably was, what's happening to you is that you've learned to move away from the golf ball to get to the ball. So, so you've moved away from it. In other words, if you're a conventional golfer and you stood with your arms hanging straight down, you've learned to, to jump or move your body in a way to get away from the ball. You're too close to it. So think about this. Now that you've moved to slightly away from the ball, and now you're in a single plane, you can now move down to the golf ball. You gotta get, you gotta get go the opposite direction. No longer do you need to move up. Now you've gotta move down. Well, how is that happening with a single plane swing? And it's pretty simple, although this is probably gonna be the challenging thing for you, because if you're a jumper, a guy who's been jumping the whole time to get to the ball, you're now gonna have to change the way you approach hitting the ball. Here's how you do it. Basically, there's two things you focus on. One is the lead knee being flexed. It's pretty simple, lead knee flexes. Second one is the foot stays down and turns, or right hip turns. So it's, it's knee flex, stay down. Knee flex, stay down. And so you're turning with the knee flex. Now, come back over here and I'm gonna show you this because when I do this, there's just some rules of thumb. And here's the thing about it. People can't feel what they do. I mean, you can't feel what you do. That's why I use video. That's why I study this stuff on video pretty heavily. But no one can feel what they do. So here's what you got to basically take a video camera out and make sure that when you hit a golf ball that your knee is flexed from the time that you transition all the way through finish, that knee is flexed. You can't be doing this because this is lifting the body up and away from the ball. So watch when I hit this, hit the seven iron again you're gonna see my lead knee stays flexed from the time I transition all the way through the ball. So right here, flex, turn, compress, through, and then I stand up. So lead knee flexed is a big part, but you gotta make sure you get that right. So let's do this. Let's head out to the course. A couple things I wanna show you out there is how do you take this and hit side hill eyes, downhill eyes, and some shots around the golf course. Okay, I've been working on a shot. I have no idea if next week this will work or not, but there's some signs to this, which I'm trying to figure out, but I want to show you something. So a lot of times you have a difficult bump and run where you can't land it on the green. Like look at this shot here. There's a lot of turf in here. You know, it's no, not high grass, but it's like fairway cut. You got a lot of fairway cut in here. And then you got the hole located just, you know, a few feet onto the green where you can't, you don't want to flop it in there because it's too risky. So here's my thought. Now, this is what I'm trying. Think about this for a second. I'm going I'm to just pace this off. I want to show you something. So let me measure this. So it's close to 20 paces. Now watch. So this is 10 paces right here. So basically halfway, right? Now watch, I'm gonna take a nine iron. And my goal, I want it to bounce twice. I want the ball to bounce twice before it gets to the green. So watch, and the key is, is hitting it low enough to get two bounces of the ball. And look at that. So, you know, four feet, watch this again. And I'm landing it halfway. So here, here's, my, here's my theory on these shots because I'm trying to make, I'm trying to create a predictable shot here. 
Is it high? Is it low? How about this? How about you measure, you go halfway, you hit the ball with a non-iron into that halfway spot. So I'm hitting a low non-iron, bouncing it twice and rolling it on. So watch it again. It's a two bouncer. That one missed my spot, but look, not bad, right? I'll do one more. So there's my tee. The tee's a halfway. It's a halfway shot. Halfway, there it is, bounce, bounce. Look at that. That's my next, so I'm working on this from 60 yards, 50 yards, 40 yards, because what I'm trying to do is create a predictable, hit it halfway, bounce it twice, and let it run on. And look, I'm, get, I'm getting myself up and downs there from a very difficult two bounce, bounce, bounce. There it is, perfect one right there. That was perfect. So I've been messing with this where I'm trying to find, you know, people get up here and they roll it up the hill or they put it up the hill or they chip it up the hill. I'm, I'm giving myself a two bounce chip where it lands halfway. That's all I'm doing. Halfway, two bounces, bounce, bounce. There it is, roll it out. And look at all those shots, pretty much 60, 70% up and down there. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed what I'm doing out here. I'm trying to help you on the course. I'm trying to help you answer those questions you have about the single point swing. Don't forget, subscribe to the channel, give me a thumbs up, click that bell icon for notifications, and I'll see you again because we're going to head out to the golf course in the next segment.